Hello students and welcome to this lecture on animal cell culture techniques. I am uh, Professor Anita Roy from School of Biological Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. And I will be your instructor for the next few lectures where we will look at animal cell culture, uh, why it is required, how do we do it, the techniques that are used, as well as uh, what are its applications uh, in industry as well as in healthcare sector. So, um, before we go into animal cell culture techniques, let us quickly recapitulate as to what a cell looks like. So, uh, broadly the cells in our living world can be uh, divided into prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. And if you look at this uh, diagrammatic representation of these cells, then you would see that on the left hand side, the prokaryotic cell is essentially a very simple cell. So, you see an extensive uh, DNA which is packaged into a nucleoid, right? It's a, a circular DNA highly compressed and packaged and other than that there is cytoplasm and in the cytoplasm you would see ribosomes of course but you wouldn't see any other organelles as you would in a eukaryotic cell. So the prokaryotic cell is bounded by of course a cell membrane and uh, outside the cell membrane there is a cell wall. And in certain prokaryotes, you would also find an extra outer uh, membrane that is composed of uh, lipopolysaccharides. So, this is more or less the structure of a prokaryotic cell. Whereas, if you look uh, at the diagram on the right, it shows a eukaryotic cell. So, on the right, you would see the cell is much more complex compared to the prokaryotic cell. So, the, the first uh, and the most um, striking feature is the nucleus. So, this is a membrane bound organelle that contains the DNA. So, the DNA in our cells is actually present inside this nucleus. Apart from the nucleus, you would also see other membranous structures like the endoplasmic reticulum. So, if you look here, this is the nucleus, right? And this is the endoplasmic reticulum, a vast network of uh, uh, membranous structures that is responsible for um, uh, producing a lot of our proteins. So, protein uh, folding, protein uh, glycosylations take place in the endoplasmic reticulum. Then you would find structures called the Golgi apparatus. So, this is again a membrane bound uh, organelle that is responsible for further maturation of proteins. So, further addition of sugars to the protein. Um, and this actually is an organelle that is responsible for secreting a lot of proteins outside the cell. So, a cell would be producing a lot of these proteins which might be enzymes required or which might be hormones and they need to be exported out of the cell. So, these are organelles which are responsible for those secretory pathway. Apart from that, you would also find organelles like say here you would see the mitochondria which is the energy hub of the cell which, pro, which is primarily responsible for providing energy to these cells for their survival and their growth. You would also see other organelles like lysosomes. But the main thing here is that the pro, pro, prokaryotic cell does not have these kind of organelles. So, they are much more simpler. Now, here is an image of a cross section of a bacterial cell. So, if you cut through a bacterial cell, and if you observe it under a electron microscope, this is what you would see. As I explained, a vast network of uh, these membranous structures are not present in prokaryotic cells. So, you would essentially see the DNA, the nucleoid, you would see the cytoplasm and you would see the, uh, the inner membrane, you would see the uh, uh, you would see the outer membrane. So, these are these are simple cells, right? And whereas this is a cross section of a eukaryotic cell. So, you take a eukaryotic cell, you slice it in between and if you observe it under the electron microscope, the first thing that you would see is this huge nucleus that has compacted DNA around, okay. And you would also see other structures like you would see the mitochondria or you would see lysosomes or you would even see these 
you know, these membranous structures here, the endoplasmic reticulum and so on. The other important thing to notice here is the size of these cells. So, whereas in the in the eukaryotic cell, the typical size of the diameter would be say around 10 micrometers. So, if you look at here, this is a scale bar that shows 1 micrometer and you can easily appreciate the size of these cells. Whereas, if you look at a prokaryotic cell, you see this is 0.5 microns. So, you can appreciate the size of these cell would be somewhere around say 3 micrometers. Okay. So, let us once more recapitulate the key differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. First, this, as I mentioned, the size. So, the size of a prokaryotic cell would be say around 2 microns, 3 microns on an average, you know. But the eukaryotic cell would be around say 10 microns, it's larger. Again, what is present at the outside of the uh, or the outermost part of the cell. So, you have a rigid cell wall for um, prokaryotes. You do not have such a rigid cell wall for eukaryotes except say in specialized cells like a plant cell where you have a cell wall. You have cell membrane, you have cell membrane in both, right? But you have an extra outer membrane in some of the bacteria, not in all but in some of the bacteria which you do not have in the eukaryotic cell. Then you have a cytoplasm in prokaryotes which is very simple, eukaryotes of course you have these uh, other membranous organelles and the organelles are important, they have important functions and these important functions are basically the reason why you need to culture animal cells. It is not enough to do it in bacteria. And then again, the average doubling time. So, a bacteria for a bacteria say typically uh, E. coli, you would need to give it 20 minutes to double. For an average eukaryotic cell, cells um, you would need somewhere around a day for the cells to double in numbers. Uh, so, as I explained, prokaryotic cells are simpler, right? They are very simple structures. Uh, so, if you try to produce some proteins in bacteria, you would be able to produce some of them, but not all of them. Why? Because they do not have necessary organelles, necessary uh, if I say infrastructure, necessary enzymes that are required to produce the specialized proteins that are usually seen in our body. Okay. So, eukaryotic cells are uh, equipped with that kind of machinery, they have the necessary tools to produce proteins say immunoglobulins. Okay. These are proteins which require to be modified. Uh, glycosylated to increase their half-life which cannot be done in a bacterial system. Okay, so, again let us come back and look at the unique case of animal cells. What, what is it that the human cells do that the bacterial cells cannot do and therefore we need to culture human cells? So, here is an example. We are living in the times of COVID, right? And so, we understand that viruses are affecting us, they are infecting our cells. So, if you had a human cell which is depicted here and if you put that virus, then the virus will be able to infect the human cells. But if you are trying to do that in a bacteria, then it will not work, right? So, the bacterial cells do not have the necessary what we call receptors for the virus. So, they are not able uh, they will not be infected by the virus, these COVID vi virus and therefore, you cannot study the virus in bacteria. You have to go to human cells. Another reason to study human cells. So, when a virus infects a human being, say the COVID virus has infected a human being, the human body would start producing antibodies against the virus. It is like a defense mechanism. So, if you have to study that antibody production mechanism or the cells that produce the antibody, you definitely need to culture those kind of cells. So, another reason to culture and grow animal cells. Now, as I explained, when you are talking about antibodies, the antibodies are also glycosylated. What is glycosylation? Glycosylation is nothing but addition of some sugar molecules to the protein. So, here is, so this Y shaped green structure is actually an antibody, it is a protein, okay? it is two protein chains. 
and you would have modifications on these protein chains, these, these violet, um, uh, uh, violet structures are actually pro uh, sugars. So the sugars are added to the immunoglobulins and this increases the half-life of the immunoglobulin. But where is this sugar addition taking place? It's taking place, it's initiated in the endoplasmic reticulum and then in here in the endoplasmic ret reticulum and then as the proteins move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi there is further maturation of these sugars so more different kinds of sugars are added on to the, the protein and then finally from the Golgi apparatus it is secreted out either in the surroundings or it can also be expressed on the surface of these cells. So for proper glycosylation you again need animal cell culture. So, let us recapitulate what we have learned so far. Why do we need animal cell culture? We need animal cell culture to study, say, viruses that would infect our bodies. So we, if we need to understand these viruses, how do they function? We need to grow animal cells. We need to grow human cells. Again, if we need to produce um, uh, antiviral therapies, right, if we need to produce drugs, that can target these uh, viruses or the virus multiplication, replication machinery, we would have to culture these, right? Again, if we need to develop vaccines against the, these viruses, we would again have to go to animal cell culture, human cell culture. Furthermore, if we need antibodies and we would like to produce antibodies, we cannot do it in bacteria, we have to do it in human cells. If we need good post-translational modifications that would enhance the lifetime of the proteins. It need not always be antibodies. It could also be other proteins, you know, other proteins that are uh, used in therapy. Then again, we have to choose a suitable uh, cell, cell model. So again, we cannot use it in bacteria. We have to move to animal cell culture. So drug testing, I've already mentioned that. Stem cell therapy. So Today we hear a lot about bone marrow transplantation, stem cell therapy. So if we have to understand how to obtain these stem cells, they are very little in number and perhaps you need to grow them a little bit more, get a little bit more in number so that you can put it into the patients. You again need to culture them. Okay. So again, the requirement for animal cell culture comes in. And finally, understanding basic biology and understanding life. So for very fundamental scientific research, you would need animal cell culture. You would need to grow human cells. So let us look at some of the terms that we need to remember when we are talking about um, animal cell culture. So the first thing is, what is cell culture? So if you look here, it's mentioned the cell culture is a process of growing cells outside the body of the organism in a glass or a plastic dish or flask and under controlled environmental conditions. Why controlled environmental conditions? Because in our body when the cells are growing, they have a very controlled condition. So controlled condition in terms of temperature, in terms of pH, in terms of oxygen or carbon dioxide availability and so on and so forth. So we will discuss all of these but cell culture means that you have to grow these cells take them out from the organism. So if it is a mouse cell, you take it out from the mouse. Human cell, you take it out from the humans and you grow them in a suitable condition, okay? In vivo. So in vivo is a term that, you know, uh, describes study of, uh, say, tumors or cells inside an organism. So in vivo, inside the living organism. Say you're looking at how a tumor is going, growing in a human being or how, uh, how uh, cells are dividing in a mouse. So that would be in vivo. In vitro, so when you take that tumor cells out and grow them in a plastic dish, in a glass dish, that would become in vitro, okay? Literally translated as in glass. You can have in silico. So nowadays you can simulate a lot of these conditions. So if you exactly know what are the conditions that affect growth of a cell, say you know you have given uh, X amount of glucose, Y amount of oxygen, 
you know, and if you play around with these parameters, you understand that how fast your cells will grow and you can simulate this whole thing on your computer, on your desktops or your laptops, then that would be in silico. There's another term that we would use very frequently and that is clone. So what is a clone? So uh, I think the word itself may, need not, may not require an introduction because we use it in our everyday lives nowadays, but clone for a cell would be when, you're, when you take a cell and when you let it divide and it grows into a number of cells. So each of these cells would very closely resemble the initial cell. So these, this population that has grown out of this initial cell would be the clone of this cell. And each of these cells in the population will also be clones of each other. So they would be very similar to each other, almost identical. I said almost identical. Okay, so what are the advantages of using cell culture? So the first advantage is because you are starting with a starting material and you can grow them, you can produce a clone. So they are very similar to each other, almost identical, right? And this is very important because when you're doing drug testing and if you have a cell A behaving in a certain way and cell B behaving in a certain way and they will both respond to the drugs differently, then you do not know what to conclude. So it is important to have cells which are very similar, almost identical to each other to understand how much of drug causes what amount of response, right? So they're very homogeneous. That's one of the advantages. The second is that you can control physical chemical parameters uh, almost um, uh, very precisely. So you can control pH, oxygen, all of these parameters can be controlled uh, very easily. And then the third thing is that when you're growing these cells in vitro, right, outside the body of an organism, you can very easily manipulate the cells. So suppose you do not want a certain gene to be expressed, a certain piece of DNA to be expressed. You do not want a certain protein to be present. You can simply add uh, something called um, an RNAi, which would silence that gene. So let us take a while and try to understand what this is. So you have a DNA, right? You have a double helical DNA that is coding for your certain protein. And this piece of DNA would then produce an mRNA. And from there you would get your protein, okay? You do not want for certain reason this protein to be expressed. You do not want this protein to be expressed. What can you do? You can produce an interference. That is, if you produce an RNAi or a piece of RNA which has complementarity to this mRNA, then by certain mechanisms, this mRNA is degraded and the protein production is inhibited, right? So that you can, you can easily do this. You can also add uh, certain proteins into the cell, but it's easier to add the DNA than to add the protein into the cell. So if you, if you know the DNA corresponding to the protein you want to be expressed, you can simply add that DNA into the cell. And this is a very easy technique. It's, uh, uh, we will learn about the techniques used to do this. And similarly, you can manipulate, which means that given a homogeneous cell population, you can add or delete a protein and see the effects. So some things that we would like to do in the laboratory. And so together these make the cells very conducive for biopharmaceutical companies and biopharmaceutical application. However, there are certain limitations. As I explained that these uh, cells require very definite conditions to grow. And if you're growing cells in very large amounts, large numbers, then achieving this condition can become difficult. There are ways to overcome it, but again, it is quite difficult to achieve these conditions and it's also quite costly. The second thing is that it's very highly sensitive to perturbations, which means that, again, you have to maintain those conditions, the conditions of temperature, pH, everything very accurately, all right? The third thing is that you are growing a 
homogeneous population of cells, right? They're very identical to each other. This has its advantages. As I explained, if you have cell A behaving in a certain way, cell B behaving in a different way, then if you add drugs, you're not looking just at the effect of the drugs, you're also looking at different behaviors of cell A and cell B, right? But in a homogeneous, identical population, you're just looking at the effects of the drug. Now, if you think of our human body, it's not made up of one particular cell. We have, we have like billions of cells in our body and each of them are quite different. So the cells that constitute your muscles are quite different from cells that constitute your brain. So the neurons are different from the muscle cells, right? And they're also very different from the blood cells. And each of, all of them together constitute the human body. So when you add a drug, it's not just the effect of the drug on a particular cell, because the drug is also going to different parts of your body. So your muscle cells would also be looking at it. Your blood cells will also be looking at it. And so would the cells in your uh, stomach. So therefore, ideally, if you are trying to understand how a drug would affect, you would have to look at the whole organism, not just a cell. So these are certain limitations. You know, you can, you can understand the effects up to a certain point, but beyond that, if you have to understand the effect of the drugs, you have to go into an organism, say a mouse or a human being. All right, so, so far we were looking very generally at animal cell culture. What are the, uh, what is the importance of it? What are the limitations of it? Why do we need animal cell culture? Why can't we just culture bacteria? Because they grow faster, you know, but we cannot always produce everything in bacteria. So we need animal cell culture. But now let us go back into the history of animal cell culture and try to understand from a historical perspective how animal cell culture actually started, how human cell culture started. So it all started with George Gay and Margaret Gay. Now George was working in uh, Johns Hopkins and what he was trying to do is he was trying to get cells, human cells growing indefinitely in his laboratory. And he used to receive patient samples. So one of this patient sample from a woman called Henrietta Lacks arrived one day in his laboratory. And this uh, tumor sample, he used that to produce the first human cell line, which is called HALA. So here on the right, you can see the image of a HALA cell line. This is the first cell line to be produced, the human cell line to be produced. So you can see here it's got very distinct nucleus. You can see the shape of the cells, very beautiful cells, all right, and the very first cell. But as I mentioned, it was obtained from a patient who was suffering from carcinoma, adenocarcinoma. And that cancer was taken out from the body of the patient and was uh, uh, from that cancerous mass, they produced these single cells that were then adhered on the plate and they grew indefinitely. So that gave rise to the first immortal cell line, HILA. So what is an immortal cell line? Immortal cell lines are cells that can grow indefinitely in culture. So this cell line, after its production, it has been continuously in culture for decades now and it's still growing. So these cells haven't died. But the, this comes out of the property of cancer. So as we know, cancer is something that grows, right? It has an indefinite growth property. And that same property was conferred into these cells. So if you take these cells, put them in certain number on a plate, right? In the proper growth condition, they will grow. And they will grow until they fill up this entire plate. And then you take some cells from here, put in another plate, and they will keep growing. This, so this keeps repeating. Now, let's come to some fun facts, okay? So, we have learned about HILA, the first immortal cell line, the human cell line, right? And you also know about polio. So, not so long ago in India, we had incidences of polio until polio vaccine eradicated polio from our country. But the first polio vaccine to be used for large-scale immunization was developed by Jonas Salk. And when Sark wanted to develop this 
vaccine, he needed cell lines and the cell line of his choice was HeLa. And in fact, George Gay had shown quite earlier that you could use HeLa cells and infect them with poliovirus and poliovirus does indeed infect these HeLa cells. So you could imagine that this was really revolutionary in those times. They were using a cell line that they had newly uh, found and uh, that could be used to produce um, in some form vaccines, right? All right, so at that time, people really had this idea that if you take out cells from the human body, they would grow indefinitely, no matter what kind of cell. You know, they didn't have the concept that it has to be a cancerous cell and they in general thought that if you take out cells from the human body, the cells would keep growing and they would be immortal. So Leonard Hayflick actually showed that that's not true, that normal human deployed cells, they do not grow indefinitely in culture. They have a finite replicative lifetime, lifespan. So on the right, you can see uh, this is actually a graph that represents the number of times the cells divided before they died. So what Heflick did was he took out these cells, the human deployed cells, and you can see the image of these beautiful cells here. So the cells, they appear to have a very nice spindle shape. There is a very beautiful nucleus in the center of these cells. And when he uh, cultured these cells in the laboratory, under laboratory conditions, he could grow these cells until a time point when the cells didn't grow very well. And after that, the cell numbers kept decreasing. So when this happened, when the cell numbers kept decreasing, this is how the cells looked. They, they didn't uh, have that beautiful spindle shape. The nucleus was also not very prominent or well stained, and then the cell died. What this shows is that normal deployed cells of our body, they have a finite lifespan after which they would die. So they would divide a number of times and after which they are destined to die. But cancerous cells do not obey this. They can keep growing, okay? So if you take cancerous cells and if you're able to produce cancerous cells growing on a surface, they would have the property of immortality. Whereas if you take any other human cell, which is non-cancerous, normal deployed cells, they will grow for a certain period of time after which they will die. So they are not immortal. They are mortal and they have a definite, finite replicative lifespan. Okay, so if we take a normal deployed cell from the human body and try to grow them in vitro on a glass, okay, how would that look? So initially you, you seed a certain number of cells, okay, they would take time to understand how their uh, surrounding is, take time to adapt, and then they would slowly start to grow. So they take time to adapt, phase one, they start to grow, phase two, and then they keep growing and growing and growing until they have reached their replicative, uh, the end of their replicative capacity. And that period is depicted here, after which the cell numbers would go down, okay? so. Primary cultures grow in this fashion. So these are primary cultures. You've taken them out of the human body and you start to grow them. So there's the primary culture and then you uh, take that culture and you do subcultures. So you have a plate into which you put the cells from the human body. They have grown, filled up the plate. Now you take some cells out from there, start to grow it on another plate and so on and so on. So this is called subculturing and the cultures that come out of the primary cultures are called the subcultures. So you keep growing them and they would be growing in this exponential phase, the phase two, and after which there is a cessation of division. So they will not divide anymore. They don't die instantly. They are still metabolically active. They don't instantly like stop dividing and start dying. That doesn't happen. They stop dividing. They are still alive, active metabolically, but they will stop dividing and then their numbers would go down and they would die. So then 
we come to two more terms, continuous cell cultures, right? So if you are taking out cancerous cells from the human body and you're trying to grow them, so suppose you've taken a few cells from a cancerous mass and you put them on a plate. And then after some time, you'd see that the cells are growing. They will fill up the plate. You take some cells out of this plate. So this is called subculturing, right? You take out some cells from this plate because it's filled up. You take out some cells from this plate, put it in another plate, that's subculturing. And then again, they would keep growing. You repeat that, they would again keep growing. You repeat that, they would keep growing. So this is a continuous cell culture. The cells are immortal, right? Whereas if you have a finite cell culture with a definitive lifespan, then you take out those few cells from the human body, normal diploid cells, you put them on a plate, they will grow, they will fill up the plate. You can do a subculture, you can take some cells out, put it on another plate, again they will grow, they will fill up the plate. You can do that again and at some point when they have reached the limit of their replicative capacity, they wouldn't divide anymore. They would still be alive until they slowly start to die out. So let us recapitulate once more. So what is a primary cell culture? Primary cell culture would be, which, which would mean that you are taking cells from a source, say a tumor or a normal human tissue or a normal, even uh, say any other animal tissue, say mouse or uh, even say a fish, you take that out and then you take that tissue, you dissociate that tissue into single cells and then you put that in controlled environment with the required uh, growth conditions and you allow them to grow. So that is your primary culture, okay. So what is the secondary culture? Now your primary culture has grown, okay. It's filled up the plate. You take out some cells from that primary culture, put them into a new plate. So now you've made a subculture. So this is now your secondary culture. And if you can keep doing this repeatedly, that would give rise to your cell line. Now cell lines can also be of two types. Suppose you have taken uh, cells from a cancerous tissue, so that would be, have immortal capacities. Then those cells can be grown indefinitely in culture. You can keep subculturing them, okay? And there's no, uh, there's no uh, limit to their replicative capacity. In that case, it is a continuous cell line. Whereas if these cells are normal deployed human cells, then they would have a finite replicative capacity. After some time, they will die. So therefore, you can subculture them once, maybe twice, maybe thrice, maybe 100 times, but not more. Once they have reached the limit of their replicative capacity, they will uh, stop dividing and then they will slowly die out. Okay. So along with this, there are two important concepts, very important concepts that I'd like to give you. And that is in, intrinsically linked to animal cell culture. So uh, as I explained, you can take some cells, right, from say normal human cells, deployed human cells with a finite replicative capacity. You've taken those cells, you've put them on a plate and you've put so many cells on a plate, they are growing and then they would grow until they fill up the plate. So what happens when they fill up the plate? Then you take out some cells from here and you do something called a passage or a passage. What this actually means is that you're taking out some cells from a plate where the cells have grown to their maximum capacity and you're subculturing them. From that plate, you're putting them into a fresh plate so that they again start growing. But why do you need to do this? You know, why can't you just keep them in that plate and they would grow and grow? Do they grow? No, they do not. They do not because these cells are anchorage dependent. There are two terms here. So first term is anchorage dependence. What does that mean? So most cells in our body, except say uh, cells of the blood, which are of course in the blood and they're in the flow, but most cells in our body, they require a certain Mm, attachment to grow. So they are not free floating, they are adhered somewhere. And as long as they have that surface to adhere and attach, they grow and they are happy and healthy. But the moment they don't have that attachment, they stop dividing. Okay, so this is called 
anchorage dependence. But this anchorage dependence is a property of normal cells. Cancerous cells have lost this anchorage dependence and they simply start to pile on top of each other. So that is one of the reasons why cancers can grow. Whereas when we are born, we are born with a certain size of our organs or say our hands, our legs. But during our lifetime, our hands grow in size, right? Some of our organs grow in size. Now, how does that happen? That is very controlled. We do not end up with a, a, a hand that was supposed to be this long, but has ended up being four meters long. It doesn't happen because the cells have anchorage dependence. So long as they have this, uh, the layer on which they can grow, they grow. After that, they don't. Cancers don't abide by that. Therefore, the cancers grow massively. Or tumors don't abide by this and tumors can grow massively. So if you were to culture cancerous cells, then you would find that even after the cells have filled up the plate, they start piling on top of each other and they do not grow as monolayer, a single layer of cells. They can pile up on top of each other. Okay. So along with this, the, another concept is the concept of contact inhibition. So as I explained, here is a dish. So, so far you were looking at the dish from the top. So here is a dish and you're looking at it from the top. So suppose you're looking at the dish from the side. So this is that kind of uh, view and you have cells growing on this. You've added some cells and you're culturing them in the right conditions. So they will grow and grow. And normal cells, as I said, would grow until they have this layer to grow on. But cancerous cells don't obey that and they can pile up on each other. So another concept here is the concept of contact inhibition. So these cells, they not just uh, understand that there is no surface to grow, but they also understand that they are, uh, they are completely covered by their surrounding cells. When that happens, that is called contact inhibition. They stop growing. So this is again a property of normal cells. Cancerous cells do not obey this. They do not show contact inhibition. They do not obey these laws and therefore they can pile up on top of each other, whereas normal cells do not. All right, so let's go to some fun facts, okay? So we have understood that when cells grow, they grow on, as a monolayer except for cancerous cells, right? The cancerous cells, they can pile up on top of each other. So if we are growing cells on a monolayer and they have covered up completely the plate, we need to transfer them to a new plate. So from one plate, we could make say four plates because now we have enough cells to uh, have some cells in say four plates or we could even put them in eight. We could put them in two new plates. So when we do this, when you do this kind of a subculturing or when we passage or passage these kind of cells, how do we do it? We use something called trypsin. Okay, so trypsin is present in our gastric juice. It's an enzyme and that is responsible for digesting proteins, right? So trypsin is used in cell culture and it is used to get these cells detached from the plate. And the first use of trypsin was done by Rouse and Jones and Rouse is also credited for showing for the first time that viruses are also responsible for causing cancers. So what we do in, in the laboratory or in cell culture is that when you have this plate that is completely covered with cells, you add a little bit of this trypsin, controlled amount of trypsin for a controlled period of time. You cannot keep it very long because then they will start to digest all the proteins present on the surface of the cell. You don't want that. So controlled amount of trypsin, controlled amount of time, and you would see that the cells will detach. When they detach, they lose their shape and they will start floating. So then you can take the cells, wash them, put them in. So from one plate, you can put them in say two, four, eight, as many number of plates as, uh, as is required. And then you can do subculturing or passaging. So let's recapitulate again what we have learned so far. So what is a primary cell culture? So you have an organ or you have a cancerous mass. 
you take that organ or you take that cancerous mass and you can uh, macerate that mass to produce single cells. You take those single cells and you put them in a, uh, in a dish, in a flask and you grow them under controlled temperature, controlled conditions and that would constitute your primary culture. Now, if you have enough cells growing on the plate and you see that the cells do not have enough surface to grow and there is every chance of contact inhibition, you take those cells out, trypsinize those cells and you subculture them into a number of plates and this is called a secondary culture and by this you can produce a cell line. The cell line could be a continuous cell line with an indefinite growth span and that happens when you are growing cancerous cells. But if you are growing normal diploid human cells, they have a definite lifespan. So after a period of time, after a certain number of divisions rather, they would stop dividing and then they will eventually die. So uh, that's all for the uh, culture uh, part today. In the next lecture, we will uh, see furthermore how we, ca how we can culture the cells, what are the procedures used to culture the cell, what are the things required to culture the cells. Thank you.